Welcome to Music and Money series. My name is Wale Ogunleya, and I'm the head of sports entertainment at UBS. Billboard and UBS has partnered to help increase the awareness around financial resources available to all entertainers. Today, I'm joined by Billboard Deputy Editor Rob Levine and Primary Wave CEO Founder Larry Mestal to discuss the music license market from AI to international markets and everything in between. But before we start our questions that I have for these young men, uh, I want to do a proper introduction for, for Mr. Mestal. Uh, Larry is the founder and CEO of Primary Wave Music and has been working in the music and entertainment industry for over 30 years. In 2006, Mestal took his extensive experience working at multiple record labels and founded Primary Wave Music, one of the largest independent music publishing, marketing, and talent management companies in the United States. Private Wave controls over 50,000 songs from catalogs of legendary artists such as Bob Marley, Stevie Nicks, The Four Seasons, Whitney Houston, James Brown. I can continue to go on and on and on. Obviously, he's a very important man in this industry. So with that being said, gentlemen, thank you for being here with me. Thank you, Wally. Good to be here. Thank you. Great. So I'll dive right in. Uh, for, for, for you, and we'll start with you, if you don't mind, Rob, uh, on this question. Yeah. Uh, what are the emerging trends and market disruptors that are likely to uh, shape the music uh, licensing market in 2024? As far as disruptions, you know, the, by definition, I guess you don't see them coming always. One of the things we're seeing, though, is, you know, the streaming market is growing, especially internationally. And that makes it harder, a little harder, not impossible, but a little harder to make predictions. You have a fairly good idea what's going to be popular over time in the US and the UK and Europe. But you've got a lot of people in Africa streaming music now, a big audience in India. Is that going to increase the value of Western music? Are people there going to listen to more music from those countries? We have an idea, but we don't totally know. I think that's going to be a big factor. Next question I think I'll give to 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 you, Larry, um, you know, we are at UBS, so again, you know, we've got high, high interest rates. And if we want to talk about, you know, microeconomics, um, there has been a speculation that, that, that rising interest rates would negatively impact valuations. Have you seen that? First of all, let me just finish what Rob was saying, mm -hmm. uh, because we are very, very bullish on emerging markets. We just bought a company, Times Music in India. We actually think that India, Brazil, um, a lot of places in Southeast Asia are going to very positively affect the cash flow of the catalogs and the artists that we uh, own and represent. So that's a very big piece uh, when, you're, when you're talking about valuations and also technology, you know, things like TikTok, it's only growing and they're starting to pay uh, royalties when there weren't before. So uh, I completely agree with Rob on emerging markets and streaming and, and technology platforms. With respect to uh, interest rates, you know, look, like every business, this is a business of supply and demand. And, and our business is only getting better uh, because we're well capitalized. You know, we started 17 years ago, we have 180 catalogs. So as interest rates go up, it's harder for financial institutions that came in the business three, four and five years ago to compete uh, because, um, you know, there are just less people interested um, or less financial institutions interested uh, as as rates go up because um, you know giving pricing uh, it's easier to put your money in a in a treasury bill than it is uh, to to pay prices that compete with uh, firms like us that have been around uh, a while you know a financial institution has to pay significantly more than I do uh, to get an artist catalog because they have no infrastructure they have no history and working with artists. They have no marketing teams, branding teams, digital strategy teams. So artists, you know, are very smart. They, you know, while money is important in a transaction, partnership, um, you know, maintaining legacy and growing uh, an artist's uh, value, cash flow, and, and, um, and legacy is also very important. So um, you know, interest rates are certainly affecting valuations. Yeah, and I think I think for the next one, on, uh, if we're going to talk about negative impact on valuations, a hot topic that we've been seeing here at UBS um, is the topic on AI, right? Uh, people are looking at it as a threat. I know uh, creatives, artists alike are looking at it as 
uh, something that they need to be wary about. Um, and, and if you're looking at from a streaming perspective, it, it does seem like AI may be a threat to streaming, um, but there are some opportunities there. Um, would one of you want to opine on what maybe those opportunities are as, as, as we look at AI? I'll jump in. One of the things that, you know, people initially perceived AI as a threat, but what we seem to be seeing now, and obviously this could change, is it may be a threat to creators' dignity more than to their pocketbooks. You know, if you're Drake, you might be reasonably offended by the idea that someone's imitating your voice. But that could be something that you disdain artistically, but doesn't have a big negative effect financially. Mm -hmm. Financially, this is looking more and more like it's going to be another great licensing opportunity. For one thing, if you want to train an AI on a body of music, you are going to have to license the song rights and the recording rights, and also most likely a number, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, a number of other rights like likeness rights. I'm going to set Larry up for this because he was a pioneer in terms of licensing as many rights as are available. Because if you only have some rights, you can only do some of that transaction. The more rights you have, the more valuable the catalog is. You know, people were afraid of Napster. Uh, the record industry fought a digital revolution. AI is an opportunity, and AI is an opportunity, uh, you know, for further expansion in the business. We're very excited about it. Um, and Rob's right. You know, we uh, we were one of the first to also buy ancillary rights, name, like name, likeness, and image. And to the extent that you can harness AI for further marketing and further brand opportunities, you know, we're, we're going to take and are taking those opportunities. So we see it as a way to further expand our revenue stream and grow the market value of our artists. Interesting, because, you know, when we do talk to, you know, some of our clients and our artists uh, and creators, they, they're definitely on the side that they're afraid that AI is going to take, you know, food off their table. Um, and it is interesting to see that there are some opportunities. And if you, um, you know, take you guys' approach to this, I, I think it's, it's, it's advantageous to learn more about the opportunities there. And, and that's, that's great insight for you. I also wanted to say that the combination of AI and other technologies will create other opportunities. One thing you're seeing now is touring like business for legacy acts for example the abba show in london is they have quote unquote avatars that's not ai but it is a show that uses likeness rights recording rights publishing rights and you're seeing a lot of different kinds of show uh, different kinds of shows the beatles love show in vegas other cirque du soleil shows those strategies are not appropriate for every act but i think different acts will use them in ways that we can't begin to imagine the one thing we know about those kinds of shows is that you're going to need to license all the rights i mean that's i mean that's a good that's a great another re revenue stream for our artists to do thinking outside the box which is, is going to be great for uh the industry if you look at it as a plus and not just always in, in the negative connotation that AI has been recently. Uh, thank you for that. Let me talk to you, Larry, a little bit about the buyouts, right, of these various rights. This is what you do, right? This is your space, your place. Uh, at the end of the day, no one understands or really understands who's winning in in this space. Maybe you can tell us who's winning in that. But more importantly, too, for, for our, our viewers, they want to know what role does marketing play in helping yeah. to uh, get you know bigger payouts yeah uh, for the rights sure well let's let's look at this in two different phases first um in that regard when you say who's winning um you know from our perspective and our artist perspective we do deals with both the artist wins and primary wave wins because we partner with artists we almost never buy out a hundred percent. We're looking to buy 50% or 60% and actually invest in a partnership. And so, you know, why is it important? Well, you know, the reason why it's such an interesting business for us and our investors and our partners is because if you do it the right way and you mentioned marketing, 
you have Bond-like characteristics. You take uh, many of our catalogs and our artists, they've been generating cash flow, predictable cash flow for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 60 years in the case of a Bing Crosby that we uh, we partnered with, uh, the estate or, or, a, or a, a Glenn Gould or a Count Basie, right? I mean, those are long, long predictable cash flows. You know, more recently, you know, Prince, uh, Talking Heads, the doors that we partnered with, um, you know, those are 30 and 40 years worth of cash flows, very predictable. But if you do what we do and you have an infrastructure and most companies don't, most of our competitors do not, but we have, you know, 16 digital strategy uh, people that do playlist pitching. We build our artist websites. We build their e-commerce sites. We have eight brand people. We have marketing teams. We have a content creation team. We're cre we, we've got 35 different biographical films documentaries, Broadway shows in the pipeline right now, if you add marketing, and I view that as marketing, I don't view synchronization as marketing, synchronization is licensing, everybody does licensing. What separates us and what separates your question about marketing and adding value is having that infrastructure to be able to generate new revenue streams. So you can take these bond-like characteristics of long predictable cash flows and turn them into equity returns if you work hard and you create these new revenue streams, you know, there's very limited risk when you're talking about long lived assets. They're uncorrelated to the market. They get great tax treatment, right? Because you get capital returns. Um, um, and, you know, look at what Rob just said about streaming, emerging markets, et cetera. It's, it's really a very, very good business where you can take bond-like characteristics of these assets and create equity returns. And that's what we think we do better than anyone else in the world. What separates us from our competitors is that marketing, branding, and content creation component, which virtually none of the independent competitors that we have do. Thank you two gentlemen for joining us today on Music and Money. Obviously, me sitting in this Zoom with both of you has been uh, very informative and I'm sure our creators and artists and clients alike uh, appreciated the time and the information you shared with us. Thank you guys. Well, a pleasure meeting you. Same, same. Hope I see you again. Thanks, Bob. Good seeing you Thanks, too. Thanks,